Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good, live from Iowa Catholic Radio's Mercy Live Up Studios. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. Dr. Bud Marr. And I am coming to you live in the Central Standard Time Zone of Domine, Iowa, Iowa, Iowa. Uh, the Iowa Catholic Radio Mercy Live Up Studio here in Des Moines, where I'm the director of the Zeta Institute for Foundations and Ethics and Leadership and director of Mission and Ministry at Mercy College of Health Sciences. Thanks to the miracle device of robot innards and Lord Google's uh, fortuitous foresight. We are joined by Bud Marr, who is over in the Eastern Time Zone in Pittsburgh, America. Bud! Yes. You're there. I'm here. From where? Very much here. From uh, National Institute of Newman Studies in Pittsburgh. And I feel like um, I may have given you, Bo, a um, a bad image of Pittsburgh to start off with this past year. Oh, yeah? Like, we've been making the inside jokes about... Um, French fries. French fries on salads, but... Uh, I've recently discovered, and I should have discovered it sooner because it's sort of a Pittsburgh staple, Pamonte Brothers. Uh-huh. And uh, this restaurant grew up like when um, when the steel workers were going in for their shift, they needed a sandwich that would cover their protein needs throughout the day. Yeah. So it's a good use of potatoes because they do, they do grilled meats, and then it's like french fries and coleslaw on Italian bread. Oh, wow. And I think when I, if you ever visit, I'll introduce you to Pamonte Brothers instead of, you know, Something greens. Well, you know what? I actually think you're going to have an influx of Okies visiting uh, Steelerland because the Pittsburgh Steelers basically drafted like half of Oklahoma State's starting yeah. roster. So yeah, well, we're going to have to go see when uh, when Big Ben finally uh, can't walk around anymore. That's going to be uh, former Oklahoma State Mason Rudolph throwing to former Oklahoma State uh, James Washington. So you got to prep your friends out there for me. Big Ben is kind of temperamental. He's like, I'm not going to text the new guy because he's a cocky young kid. <laughs> yeah. But, no, I, I saw that with the draft, that the Steelers really zeroed in on Okie State players. And, honestly, I think there's something to the fact that, so the Cowboys played uh, Pitt out here in and September. demolished them. And I think, yeah, I think the Steelers must have done some scouting there, and they're like, wow. <laughs> That's the way to do it. A massacre, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, Lord knows how big uh, those those two young men might grow eating the Pamonte Brothers sandwiches that you just mentioned. (laughs) We're not sponsored by Pamonte Brothers, everyone. This is. Just well, how it goes you can you can work on it though, bud. You know yeah. what though? If you do, if you enjoy the show, I we I I want to call this uh, initiative the Get Bud Out of the Well initiative. You know, remember when mm-hmm. remember when Jessica was in the well? If you're like in your thirties, uh, mm-hmm. Bud of course comes to us like I said from the Eastern Time Zone, largely on the phone. And you know, Bud, we get to hear your voice, but we don't get to hear all the fullness of the dulcet tones it emits. And so, one of the things we're working on is getting what's called a Comrex Opal device, uh, which will make you be able to sound as crystal clear as John Leonetti when he's on the road. And everyone knows how uh, just fragrant his voice is, if I can use the word like that. Um, so, how are we going to do this? Well, we need to raise some funds, and we have a new way to do that. So, if you go to Patreon.com/slash ICR for Iowa Catholic Radio, patreon.com, ICR. You can sign up to donate, but how these donations are different, if you donate there, uh, it goes specifically to getting this uh, equipment so that Bud can sound like John Leonetti, and uh, you get free extra content. So, for instance, at the end of this show, um, Bud and I will record a short little segment, and if you're a patron over at Patreon, uh, you could hear this uh, this special um, exclusive content. So patreon.com slash ICR, help Bud's voice get out of the well. So I don't know, Bud, does that make you uh, excited? Are you going to donate to yourself? I am. I feel nervous now that you said I'll sound like John Leonetti. I don't know if that's possible. Better than John Leonetti. Let's just, like, shoot for the stars on this one. Uh, that's a lot of aristoc- aristocratic blood flowing through John's veins. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the aristocrats, uh, an aristocratic institution when it comes to uh, printing, your printing needs, Cartridge World. Cartridge World, 801 73rd Street, Windsor Heights, that very aristocratic neighborhood here in Des Moines. Um, if you want to, like, for instance, uh, print out your family tree, since we're sticking with aristocrats here, guess who has your printing needs covered, bud? Cartridge, Cartridge World. Cartridge World. And if you forgot to send your mother um, a Mother's Day card, you need to follow up with that, or you're getting prepped for Father's Day. Look at Cartridge World in Windsor Heights, 
515-564-7400. Did I get that phone number right? I don't know, but I know oh, one thing that you got. 73rd, Windsor Heights, for sure. One thing that I know that you got absolutely wrong is no one preps for Father's Day. Let's just not lie about this one. That's one thing. <laughs> that's one rude awakening about becoming a father is everyone's like, oh, I found this clot of dirt on the way home, and it reminded me of, of paternity. So here you go. So, yeah, let's not, let's not, let's not lie, bud. No, I mean, at the end of the day, your dad probably just wants you to grill him a steak or something. But you see these commercials for, like, get your dad that special gift for Father's Day. And yeah. it's always really weird, like a box, a Swiss, Swiss Army knife that clips cigars or something. That, I don't know. That's right. Well, <laughs> in better news, things that people shouldn't uh, overlook. Uh, we're also, as always, underwritten by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Uh, Bud and I both have started the, the, the summer semester. I got a servant leadership class. You have... Uh, bioethics class again bioethics again so uh we just the thing with mercy man is if you want to get done we just keep strolling along a lot of people are either graduating last week or this week i know i think drake has finals this week um we're starting the whole second week of the summer semester over at mercy so if you want to go get done and get into the career world and you can do this all online too we have completely online uh, uh degrees that you can do mchs.edu mercy college yeah, I'm really excited about bioethics again, getting into the tough issues. But that's the great thing about Mercy, um, not just giving people, like, the highest quality preparation for the medical field, but also um, treating the whole person and, and getting getting us to think about what compassionate, holistic health care looks like. So, well, Bud, we're, college. we're coming up on the break. So speaking of yeah. ethics, we're going to have John Henry Crosby, the president and founder of the Hildebrand Project, who uh, really talks about Diedrich von Hildebrand, if uh, people know him through... Uh, Catholic theology and ethics. So stick around, and when we get back, we'll be talking with John Henry Crosby. And, Bud, if you actually have questions, I thought about this. Hopefully this can spur some more movement on the Zip Whip line. 515-223-1150. If you send in a uh, Zip Whip line message and you don't want it read out live, like you would rather us uh, consider it and then answer you, we can answer those questions now on Patreon. And if you're a donor, uh, if you're a patron, you can actually see that exclusive uh, content. So remember, the Zip Whip line. 515-223-1150. Just text in and we can talk about it on the air. Or if you let us know, we can make sure to do so um, with the patron uh, section on Patreon. And again, that's patreon.com slash ICR, P A T R E O N dot com slash ICR for Iowa Catholic Radio. Stick around. We will be back. Uncommon Good. I'm Bo, Bud. See you in a bit. The Uncommon Good. What was it that uh, drew you to reaching out to Father Slattery and um, destroying Iowa Catholic Radio's phone line? <laughs> Whoa! That was the coolest effect that's ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> What's uncommon, good, and features a bald eagle all at the same time? The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr, 10 a.m. every Wednesday. r and Realty is showing Jesus Christ at work through comical and informative programs like The Uncommon Good. Have you reached 40 and wondered, what is my purpose in life? I did. I'm Mark McGarry, and now I'm a seminarian for the Diocese of Des Moines. There was always this feeling that God wanted me for his purpose, and it took me a little longer to figure that out. Exploring the priesthood is the best thing I've ever done, and God willing, I will be ordained to that same priesthood. If you want to explore vocations in the priesthood, call Father Ross Parker at 515-237-5050. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400, and online at cartridgeworld.com. Hi, this is Trent Middendorf with Middendorf Insurance Associates. Together with West Bend, we've been protecting families' homes, cars, and businesses for over 75 years. Our priority is to listen to our clients and help them understand their needs and how to protect what's important to them. No call centers or phone trees, just our staff in Iowa trying to help others. Our number is 515-252-1414. Please think of us for your insurance needs. Middendorf Insurance Associates, are you really covered? We're 
We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. I want to already say thank you. We mentioned the Patreon account for the first time ever just a few minutes ago, and someone has already donated, uh, evidently because they are so disturbed by how you sound, Bud. So <laughs> let's get Bud out of the well. Patreon.com slash ICR. Today what we have for you, though, um, another wonderful guest that, Bud, uh, you, you know this person, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Who is our guest today? Yeah, John Henry Crosby is a translator, writer, and critic. He's the founder and president of the Hilde- Hildebrand Project. Um, his writing's been featured in different avenues online, but you can also pick up his book. Um, he translated and edited some of um, Dietrich von Hildebrand's writings with his father. That book's called My Battle Against Hitler, Faith, Truth, and Defiance in the Shadow of the Third Reich. John Henry, thank you for being with us. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me, bud. Yeah, um, so we'll jump right into it. Um, you know, Dietrich von Hildebrand is an amazing historical figure. I've been doing some research in preparation for the show, and Pope Pius XII called him the 20th century doctor of the Church. Very high praise. And yeah, I, I think maybe some American Catholics are um, less familiar or unfamiliar with von Hildebrand's life. Um, who was Dietrich von Hildebrand? Well, that's a good question. It's a difficult question because he was rather a larger-than-life figure, but many of our listeners may uh, recognize some of his more famous book titles. Maybe the most famous is Transformation in Christ, which was, I think, first published in English in about 1940, and it's been in print consistently since then, and that's a book that's been very dear to generations of Catholics. It's a book on 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 the Christian life, the life of prayer, um, and then his widow, Alice von Hildebrand, is still alive, and uh, though she's she's quite elderly at almost 95, but she she had a whole uh, career after his death in 1977, spreading his his thought and his legacy, especially on EWTN, where she became quite a a star in her own right. So it's possible that some of our listeners will know know uh, Hildebrand through these touch points, and especially through his his wife. But I mean, who was he? Well, he was a he was a great. Uh, a Catholic philosopher. Uh, he was. He saw himself above all as a philosopher, but he was a great Catholic uh, lay witness. He wrote uh, many many Catholic works on the Catholic apostolate, on Christian marriage, and so forth. He was a convert to Catholicism, so he he wasn't a cradle Catholic, but he embraced his faith very very deeply. And then during the uh, during the rise of Hitler and of communism, he became one of the most outspoken Catholic voices, perhaps. You know, I don't want to say the most, but I mean he was certainly one of the earliest major Catholic voices against Hitler, and we can talk about that in the course of the show. And then uh, just to kind of sort of tie things up, he he had a <clears throat> you know he he was it was an interesting figure uh, during the years of the Second Vatican Council because on the one hand he was he was known to be a critic of aspects of it. He was he was not happy with the uh, liturgical reform, which he thought trivialized the mass. In many ways, not not necessarily what the church was teaching, but the way it was being carried out. Um, and on the other hand, he he was he was a father of much of what we find in the council. And I don't know whether he lived long enough to fully appreciate that. You know, he was yeah. his, his writings on, for example, the critique of anti-Semitism helped to shape the way in which the council uh, spoke about Jewish and Catholic relations. And his work on marriage found its way into the council, and on religious liberty and on Christian philosophy. I mean, so he had a he had an outsized influence that that, that ultimately found a place. In even the church's official teaching at the council, and then he died in in, in 1977. He lived a long life. Uh, he came to the states uh, after his fight against the Nazis. So he, you know, he became, you know, very much a, uh, you know, he was an American citizen. He was very much at home in this country, and had a kind of second career, a second group of students, a second following. Lots of books that were written in English. Um, so that's kind of a long answer, but it's a it's a difficult life to summarize. Yeah. So Bo and I are both converts to the faith. I'm intrigued by this. Uh, when when we talk about uh, Hildebrand's conversion, what what time period are we talking about, and what were the the things that first started to draw him to the Catholic Church? Right. So he converted in in 1914 at Easter, and he would have been a um, a young man still. He was born in 1889, so he was just in his 20s, and he converted also with his his wife, uh, who then uh, predeceased him, and so this is why his Second wife is Alice von Hildebrand, but his first wife converted with him, and it's it's an interesting story, and it's very relevant, I think, to the way in which people come to the faith today. Because you know his conversion wasn't maybe your kind of it's a bit of a stereotype, but you know your 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 conversion that comes you know from a recognition of sin or maybe a discovery of the of the teaches of the church's moral teaching or you know the liberation that comes from that. 
Um, that's not just stereotypical. That's a real mode of conversion. Uh, but his conversion came somewhat differently. So he was raised in a in a totally a religious family. There was just there just was no religion. There was nothing anti-religious. There just was none. They were, um, I guess you could call them agnostics of some kind. But there was a different kind of religion in the house, which was art. So his father was a famous sculptor and painter, and the family was a very cosmopolitan family. There were sort of great figures in literature and art and culture that would come through the house. Uh, so they 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 reverenced. The beautiful, very, very highly, and and this uh, had an important role on von Hildebrand, but, or an important influence then on him later, because rather than rejecting that, uh, he began to he had a particularly great sensitivity for the beauty of things in Christianity. The beauty of saints was really the the, the entry point, you know, the, just the beauty, the radiance, the moving power of sanctity and of Christian virtue, and then of course, finally, Christ Himself, you know, as as the God Man, as a particularly Sort of radiant reality that moved him. So he he came and he was drawn in by the beauty of the faith, and then of course that opened him to the to the full teaching of the church on faith and morals and all on all of its doctrines. But that's what that's what pulled him uh, into the church, and I think that that's quite relevant today because there are many uh, who who you know just given our cultural context struggle with. Uh, sort of finding a point of access in the church, or maybe they feel alienated in it. And you know, not all of this is by any means the church's fault, but there is a there's a particular sensitivity to uh, to well, I mean, we have sort of good and bad in this, right? But I mean, there's a yeah. perhaps a, a stronger uh, emphasis on the emotional life today, um, sometimes at the disparagement of the intellectual life. But that opens up certain capacities in human beings and i think that the church wherever it has it has used the power of the arts and the power of beauty has been very successful in its evangelization so that that's the that was the mode of his conversion it wasn't you know the conversion of a newman or an augustine which are some yeah. other classic ways of converting um but it was still a a form of conversion that i think um not only was very powerful in his life but is something that many many people today can can feel very drawn by no, that's great. And, you know, looking at uh, von Hildebrand's life, one thing that really stood out to me is, uh, of course, a lot of the attention that he's gotten has been uh, due to his resistance to Nazism and to Hitler. What stood out to me is he he was one of those who really early on sensed that this was a real threat. You know, what what was it about von Hildebrand that you think um, he, he saw from the very beginning the um, the kind of threat that um, that sort of ideology posed to uh, Christian culture, right, right. Well, that's true. So, so Van Hildebrand, um, as a young professor, he was living in Munich then, um, at the teaching at the University of Munich, and so Munich, you know, being at the heart of, of Bavaria, was also very much at the heart of the rise of the Nazi Party, which got its start there. So Hildebrand had a you know a particular kind of front row seat to what was happening at the time. <clears throat> and it's true that he, I, I think one can reasonably assert that he was the first major Catholic, first Catholic of real stature, to oppose the Nazis openly and, and, and vocally in the public square. Already in, in, in 1921, when there was barely a party, um, he went to uh, to France and he gave a talk and he was asked about about various uh, political issues. And he was, uh, he was asked whether... Um, you know who was responsible for the Second World War, and you know, this was a trick question. And he 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 refused to answer. It. He says, "I don't know the facts." And he said, "Well, what about the German invasion of Belgium, which was at the beginning of the Second World War?" And he said, "It was an atrocious crime um, because it was an act of aggressive nationalism by one country against another." And this 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 gave him the reputation of being a kind of traitor. And he gets home to Germany, and there's you know a kind of uh, I guess you would call it a kind of you know scandal in the papers. And he was asked to explain himself at the university. But this is this is an interesting way of getting on the radar of the Nazis. You know, he didn't come out and say, you know, I I, I I'm voting against Hitler, you know, or I'm opposed to the Nazi Party. He came out against their their fundamental tenets. So he yeah. comes out against nationalism. He comes out against anti-Semitism. He speaks forcefully about that early on. He comes out against militarism. He comes out against the the, the paganism uh, that uh, that the Nazis embodied. So you would say, you could say it's 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 somehow appropriate that as a philosopher, you know, his his opposition comes about because he opposes their first principles, not necessarily because he opposes the effects. And I think that made him very effective, because if you, if you needed to wait to see the worst effects, you know, those were still forthcoming, so to speak. But if you were able to detect something at the level of, what, you know, of the inherent wrongness and falsehood and danger of the ideology, then you, could, then you, could, then you were very well equipped um, you know, to, to put your finger on something and, and, and 
speak openly against it right from the start. Uh, John Henry, this is Bo Bonner, and uh, this is all fascinating stuff. I think about um, people who sort of uh, embody, like men of their time, the idea that uh, their lives just really reflect uh, not only the the thoughts and theology and philosophy of the time, but just sort of the arc of history that they live in. I find it very interesting that you say uh, von Hildebrand's family was sort of an, an aesthetic uh, you know, family, that that really is something at the turn of the century, right before World War I, there is that sort of optimism, right, that, you know, beauty can save the world without God sort of idea. So it's very interesting that, like, right at the beginning of World War I, he sort of calls the bluff on uh, that sort of, uh, you know, bohemian, if you were, that's I, uh, anachronistic, but you get my point, the, the sort of bohemian southern Germanic idea that, like, we can just uh, forget about God and, and you know, sink into aesthetics and then after world war one like you said like in in so early enough in 1921 that he's he's seeing the sort of festering wound uh that's going to open up and and and, and bleed out in, in the as the nazi party um i think that that starts to be a, a tragic thing too that we look at these great figures that were brought up in 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 sort of optimism and then had to live through uh you know the shattering historical facts of the war how did von Hildebrand sort of how did the arc of his life reflect that that he, you know he he comes from this family that has uh, a, a great love of beauty and then he lives through the sheer ugliness of the two world wars how did that affect the way that he became the thinker he became yeah well those are that's that's a very sophisticated line of questioning um you know uh when you mentioned uh men people who are men of their time men and women of their time and and what I always think of with von Hildebrand was the way in which he, on the one hand, is very much um, a, a person of his time. There, there are features of his life and thought that are somehow distinctively contemporary and modern. But then there's also a way in which he was not a man of his time, not only because his Christian commitment endured over and against um, this, 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 all of this, this confusion of the period, but in, in, be, be precisely because he was, on the one hand, capable of being deeply formed by and grateful for his tradition and his background, but he was an incredibly independent spirit. And so he subjected, you might say, everything to uh, a kind of standard, which was ultimately, I think he would have said, the standard is truth. And if there are things that are untrue or evil or ugly, uh, then, they, then they have to go. You know, they, it, the fact that they are dear to me or they're in my roots is not sufficient. Um, so he was, he was, in that sense, a... Um, he's a wonderful uh, icon, I think, though, for, for those of us Christians who want, who struggle to figure out what it means to be a Christian in the world today, because, you know, he's not an iconoclast on the one hand who rejects everything, um, uh, either of the world as such, or even just the world of his time and sort of retreats into some sort of earlier time, a kind of traditionalism. But he also isn't someone who, um, you know, rejects that. I mean, he, he's constantly... Um, sort of drawing on the wealth of Christian thought and history and culture um, in in the way he lives. So, I think that the I think it was pro, I don't I mean I I don't remember any passages in his memoirs where he speaks you know about a particular sorrow connected to his upbringing. But it is definitely true that his family lived um, in in such a way that the you know the kind the problem of evil, for example, was not really felt. You know they they um, they lived a very you know, life was so elevated by beautiful things, you know, so it, in that sense, it wasn't really a Christian conception of beauty, because the Christian conception of beauty has to do, it has to make sense of or, or, or coexist in a meaningful way with the reality of sin and ugliness. It can't just cover it over. And I think that maybe there was a, a certain tendency to, you know, to let the beautiful be all of reality and to sort of not look at, at, the, at the, the ugly things. Um, so that might be the optimistic spirit. But von Hildebrand was, in that sense, a full Christian realist, because on the one hand, you know, he believed in the good, the true, and the beautiful against all of the evidence that maybe this is, maybe maybe humanity is just bad and ugly enough that that really isn't accurate. So he really did believe in the, pri- the primacy of the good, the true, and the beautiful. God made the world good and beautiful, and the truth exists. But on the other hand, you know, he was very realistic, and, and he could caution people against um, <clears throat> the dangers of of not seeing um, what is ugly. So we, one thing we can talk about, if, if you all are interested, are some of the more practical um, sort of 
sort of themes in his writing, because in his anti-Nazi writings, you know, there was a lot of critique of the Nazis, but there's also a lot of practical guidance on, on you know, how, to, how, to, how, how should Christians live under a regime like this. And I think, you know, that, that side of his thought remains particularly relevant to us today, because, you know, we may not live under, under Nazism, but we certainly live, you know, we live in the human world with, with all of the, you know, with its full reality, its, its greatness, its beauty, its opportunity for sanctity, and at the same time, the reality of sin and temptation. And, and you know, his work, I think, addresses that, that very real human context. Yeah, John Henry, we're coming up on our break, and we do, in the second half of the show, really want to dive in deep to von Hildebrand's thought. Before we move to the break, um, I think it's, I, I've met you personally, and uh, for me, it was really intriguing and kind of cool to hear some of the background to how you started the Hildebrand Project, for instance, meeting Ellis, um, um, Dietrich's uh, wife, but also you've had the opportunity to meet uh, the Pope Emeritus, uh, excuse me, Pope Emeritus, Pope Benedict. And uh, yes. could you share with our listeners what that was kind of like? Yeah, do we, we have a minute, or what, what do we have here? It'll be about three minutes here. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, yeah, yeah so I, uh, I mean, basically, the Hildebrand Project, you know, was one of those initiatives that grew, you know, with a very small but important goal, which was to translate the works of an Hildebrand. And we didn't recognize all the other things that we ought to do uh, to support the study and reception of his legacy. So we, you know, we create this organization and we put together an advisory board because I was rather young then and I have some gray hairs now, but I didn't then. And <laughs> we needed to age me a little in, in the eyes of potential donors and so on. So uh, we asked a certain Joseph Ratzinger to join the advisory board. He had known von Hildebrand and, and particularly his widow, Alice, and uh, he said yes, more or less immediately. Uh, you know, with the condition that we that he become an honorary member because he felt that you know his role in the church required a you know an appropriate distance. Um, so That's we fair come in from that. Ratzinger, from Joseph. Yeah, we take yeah. that. <laughs> and, uh, and and you know the sequence of things was just that we had a, we had a series of interactions with him beginning in in the uh, the fall of 2003 um, up until the time that he became pope. And then when he became pope, I thought, well, I guess there goes that wonderful contact. But um, his wife, uh, sorry, Dietrich's widow, Alice, and I mm -hmm. ended up with the chance to to meet the Holy Father in then the Holy Father in 2007. And I and I said, you know, I have a very bold request. And she said, indeed, it is bold. It made her very nervous that we were going to yeah. ask the Pope anything. And I and I said, would you write a letter of support that expresses why the Hildebrand legacy is so important? And by the way, could you write something that would convince both believers and non-believers alike? And he said, I'd be happy to send me a letter. Wow, so I did. And about six weeks later, after my letter, um, I get we get a, a delivery by courier from the the Washington uh, the Vatican Nunciature. That's basically the embassy in Washington. Um, and I knew, of course, what it was. I mean, it was hard not to know. And I opened it up, and there was a beautiful two-page uh, letter signed by him in his own handwriting, sealed, dated, you know, clearly given to us to be presented. Um, and, I, and it was a kind of small encyclical, can I put it this way, on the importance of faith and reason, really, and why uh, the life of reason is so important for Christian evangelization. And so, I mean, we've, you know, I, I think this Hildebrand project would not exist in the same way that it has been able to exist without that incredible early support of this remarkable man. I think that it's obvious that it was important to him because if anything can get done in Italy in six weeks, uh, <laughs> that means someone was really pushing hard. Six weeks on Vatican time is like a uh, two-day express for FedEx. So obviously, yeah, what did, uh, obviously what he Pope, really cares. What did Pope John the Twenty Third say? That someone asked him, like, how many people work in the Vatican? About he half. About half of them. About half, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. This was obviously the the influence of German efficiency. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was so remarkable. I, but I, I said that wrong. So you didn't you did not meet him, but he sent a personal letter. As a so I did meet him, and that's where I asked yes, him. That's right. I, I met him. Okay. I met him once as Cardinal Ratzinger in in, in the fall of '03, and ah, yes. that's when he had just joined our advisory board. And then I met him again. I actually met him twice. Once at a Wednesday audience where I had the chance to visit with him, and then a, yeah. a second time I met him privately with Alice. He gave us 20 minutes, and and it was there that we asked him for the letter. And and after that we had the you know about six or eight weeks later. I, I took me a week or so to send the letter, and then but his okay. letter came very quickly. 
Well, no, this is. Great. I just want to yeah. make sure I have the details correct. <laughs> well, this is yeah. fantastic stuff. Uh, we're, we are coming up on the break. When we get back, um, we'll talk about, like you said, the practical matters of his philosophy and theology that are important enough that uh, even uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth thought it important enough to, like you say, write a letter to show the good work that you're doing on behalf of uh, the legacy of uh, Diedrich von Hildebrand. So we'll be back with the Uncommon Bo- Good, talking with John Henry Crosby, the president and founder of the Hildebrand Project. After this. <laughs> But if people want to, uh, like I said, get in touch with us to figure out, um, you know, timelines, you know, you keep throwing in historical uh, dates that confuse people, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> they can go to Iowa Catholic Radio on Facebook or at IA Catholic Radio for our Twitter handle. Uh, we also have Intune, the bi weekly newsletter, sent in the email every other Wednesday, complete, easy to navigate source for station headlines, event registration, program highlights, and more. Only two emails per month, so we don't bombard your inbox, but it's a good way to keep up with everything that's happening um, around the diocese at the station, and everything like that. And like I said, uh, if you go to our Patreon account, uh, we already had someone, like I said, bud, sign up to donate uh, to be a patron. That's pretty crazy. So patreon.com slash ICR for Iowa Catholic Radio. Uh, You can donate, get exclusive content, and help us get bud out of the well. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll be back after these messages. Straight talk. Sorry, I just put that secret out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Father Andrew, uh, we were kind of embarrassing you during the break. That we wanted to delve into your dating life prior to being a priest. And I have to say, that would have been a great show. That would have, we had a lot of really... <laughs> but we yeah. won't go there, Father, just so you know. There is something to that. Straight and to the point. That's Straight Talk, heard every Tuesday at 10 a.m. with Gene Wells, Kelly Mesher Collins, and Jason Collins. r r Realty helps you see the work of Jesus Christ through timely programs like Straight Talk on Iowa Catholic Radio. Have you reached 40 and wondered, what is my purpose in life? I did. I'm Mark McGarry, and now I'm a seminarian for the Diocese of Des Moines. There was always this feeling that God wanted me for his purpose, and it took me a little longer to figure that out. Exploring the priesthood is the best thing I've ever done, and God willing, I will be ordained to that same priesthood. If you want to explore vocations in the priesthood, call Father Ross Parker at 515-237-5050. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. Hi, this is Trent Middendorf with Middendorf Insurance Associates. Together with West Bend, we've been protecting families' homes, cars, and businesses for over 75 years. Our priority is to listen to our clients and help them understand their needs and how to protect what's important to them. No call centers or phone trees, just our staff in Iowa trying to help others. Our number is 515-252-1414. Please think of us for your insurance needs. Middendorf Insurance Associates, are you really covered? We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. We are speaking today with John Henry Crosby, president and founder of the Hildebrand Project. And as we were talking to him before the break, a uh, wonderful story about how Pope Benedict XVI, the Emeritus uh, Pope uh, himself, saw the work of the Hildebrand Project as so important that he actually wrote a letter, not only um, saying, you know, good job uh, to the project, but really giving a defense about how important the work of uh, Diedrich von Hildebrand is. Um, we talked about how he he really uh, came to prominence in a lot of people's mind because of his public stance very early on against the Nazis. Um, but John Henry, what you were pointing out is that it's one thing to, of course, stand against great evils, uh, but it's another to try to give people practical ways to resist those evils in their midst. Like, like you pointed out, um, the Nazis came to power in Munich, so this is in Bavaria, ostensibly the most Catholic part of Germany, which is, uh, I guess, to our great shame or at least frustration. So what did uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand have to say to people on the ground to practically resist uh, or or live faithfully in such dire circumstances? Yes, no, It's. <clears throat> I think it's one of the, the really great features of the work, that it wasn't just, you know, the, I don't know, kind of sort of political opinions, uh, however, or even, even 
you know, moral analysis of the evil of, of the Nazis, but um, somehow recognizing that for most people what was needed was not just, you know, the arguments against this, but, um, but, but somehow the, the guidance that they would need to survive under the regime. So, you know, there, there's, there's a lot that could be said about it, but, you know, uh, and, and I would say that whenever Van Hildebrand, even in his most, uh, you know, kind of intellectual critique of the Nazis and the communists, he, there was always, you know, close to his mind <clears throat> the, the, the fact that this was a, a present reality for people. So he would often, you know, um, sort of, he, he, yeah, for example, he, <laughs> he loved to quote the line from the letter of St. Peter, you know, brothers, be sober, be alert, uh, the, you know, the, the devil goes about like a roaring lion, you know, which was sort of his way of saying this isn't just theoretical. So I just want to make clear that even when he was sort of doing the work of the philosopher, he was he was doing it with a with a sense of those who were affected uh, by by this ideology. But there are a number of essays where he very clearly turns to um, either fellow Catholics or fellow Christians, and then sometimes, you know, a broader audience. There are some essays that are very much uh, addressed to um, uh, let's call it a more secular audience, and one has, and, and the reason that's remarkable is because at that time the quote secular audience would have been much smaller than it the, today. You know that is the mainstream, but in, in in Germany and Austria at the time, the mainstream audience was a Christian audience. But he saw fit even at times to speak more broadly, and and give advice more more generally. And I think I think that gives these essays an, an enduring relevance today because even if you're not a Catholic or a believer, you can read these and feel personally challenged because he's, he's speaking very much to, you know, sort of human beings and not just to believers. But, uh, to, to, you know, to, to move to a more concrete level, there's, there's one essay that he, that he wrote uh, in particular called The Danger of Becoming Morally Numbed. And he talks about how when you live under um, the power of an evil regime and it exerts its force on you, right, it's, it's in effect. The, you, you, there are risks to you um, by, by not you know, falling into line, and so, and so on and so forth. He says that outrage initially is very powerful, and so you live, you know, you might say with a, with a, with a, you have a lived sense of the evil, and it's dangerous to you. But then he says the problem is that when, when, when the horrors committed by the regime are so constant and so continuous, you become numb to it. You know, you start to lose your sense for um, the threat that it poses. Not, not just if you don't do what's right. Uh, no, sorry, not just if you, if you fail to. Or comply with the regime, but also the threat that comes from beginning to sort of lose that sense of evil. He, he, he has this strong sense that evil is the kind of thing that if you don't reject it or if you don't live uh, in such a way that you, that you um, are free of its influence, it will in fact begin to wear you down. Uh, affect your 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 you know your moral being as as a person, and then he goes on to say that you know there comes a point where the exhaustion is so great um, of living under um, you know the kind of evil again that would have would have been the case in Nazi Germany that there's even a temptation sometimes to start to sort of rationalize and to look at it as something that well you know maybe it's not so bad or you know or or maybe or maybe to rationalize the idea that you just you know I, I well, what, who am I who am I to stand up to this I can't do anything and then people start to live. You know, uh, as he says, the danger is even to make peace with Nazism, he says in one place. And this is not the peace of, of, you know, exactly welcoming it, but sort of the peace that comes from saying, oh, well, what can I do? I need to get on with my life. And it's very astute, you know, if you think about it, because, um, you know, we think of Nazism exclusively, I think, in terms of sort of its worst manifestations, and we think of sort of heroic gestures and, and sort of acts of resistance. But what happens when you live under it for 10 years? Um, and, you know, gradually, you know, it becomes the law of the land. It becomes the culture. All of your fellow citizens or many of your fellow citizens are excited about this. Um, how do you hold out, you know? And, and so he, he takes this idea from the, from the Jesuit spirituality of, 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 of uh, um, what does he call it? He calls it, um, well, I, think, I think it translates roughly to acceptance um, and disavowal. So the idea is that the good, it's not just enough to live in the presence of the good passively. You have to own it. You have to accept it. And the same is true with, with evil. If you're confronted with evil and you can do nothing, nothing uh, to resist it or to undo it, you can still disavow it. And he thought that this kind of internal posture that you took and the idea that you needed to renew that posture gave you a certain chance of coming through an experience like this, remaining morally alive. And if that, if you know, maybe that seems fitting to um, a moment like this. The question then is, well, is that is that not quite somewhat reasonable to the circumstances we find ourselves in today? I mean, to what extent do we as Christians face, you know, maybe less 
uh, egregious evils or, or less severe temptations, but still temptations that can destroy the soul, right? I mean, if it's pornography or, uh, <clears throat> you know, even more ordinary human temptations, I mean, those risks remain, you know, and, and, and I think Van Hildebrand is onto something very wise, um, you know, that there's a certain um, sort of active remaining alert that we have to do. Maybe it's even, and I'll turn it over to you and get, get your thoughts, but it, maybe it's even not totally unlike an older spirituality in which, you know, <clears throat> for example, think of, think of that, uh, that generation that still spoke of making acts of faith, right? The idea was that it's good for you as a Christian not just to live and, and, and sort of perform certain, you know, sort of formal acts like go to church and say your rosary, but that there's even a, there's a kind of Christian life that comes alive when you make it your own. And so to say, um, uh, you know, Jesus, I believe in you, or to pray with St. Peter, you know, I believe, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I mean, those types of of, of gestures are critical uh, for the Christian life. And, and I think Van Hildebrand would say something similar exists for the evils and temptations of the day. And we have plenty of them that we're very used to, I think, as Christians. And sometimes we have to sort of remind ourselves that they are they're very threatening to us and to our children and to our families. Yeah. All of this, of course, said within the spirit of, of Van Hildebrand, who, you know, who, who, was, who was always balanced. You know, he didn't think that you know, because there was evil in the world, the basic posture of your life should be one of rejection and anger. He says that in this essay, too, that you know, we have to always pray for those who are under the influence. We can't you know, become haughty or high-handed. Uh, you know, this has to be integrated into a, uh, an overall Christian life. But this emphasis on remaining alert, that I think is something brilliant at the time and brilliant for us today. So, yeah, John Henry, you, you make me think of something, and you might not understand how hard this is for me to say, but Bud understands, and everyone in the studio. I think John Leonetti actually has a point on this, Bud. Yeah. I know, this is, this is tough for me to say. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, to your point that, you know, we, gotta, we have to have sort of like acts of devotion or acts of, of uh, enunciating what we believe, because sometimes if we just go over it too easy... Um, we can start to, like you say, maybe fade into the background of everybody else's uh, desires or worries. So he had a priest instruct him to say the creed 100 times a day, which is crazy, but uh, John doesn't even do that. John just says what the most important part for him is the priest said to say the creed line by line and ask if you really believe it. You know, mm -hmm. I, like, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Do you? Is there any real way in your life that you show that you do that? And, you know, you go down the whole line. And so that reminds me maybe of what you're saying is, um, of course, our ceremony, our ritual are never just going through the motions unless we are the ones just going through the motions. Um, but there's a way in maybe our times, uh, the, the practical thing to remember is if we slow down and ask, uh, like you said, these sort of acts of faith, hope, and love, these acts of devotion. And it can start with the creed, or it can be, like you said, the other ones, where we ask ourselves, in the face of all of these things, do I show uh, what is really, you know, that I believe all of these things? Because we say we believe, uh, and then, you know, the Apostle James reminds us that we have to live, ha we have to live our belief as well. And it seems to me, um, if I had to summarize what you were saying, that that's what Diedrich von Hildebrand was really getting at, is these are the times now to demonstrate um, that we believe what we've said all along. Yes, I think that's absolutely right, and I think that the, you know, there there, there are surely, this is, I mean, in some sense, this is obviously classic human, uh, classic uh, spiritual advice that, uh, and I think we find it in many of the saints, St. Ignatius and many, many others that, that the Christian life, you know, is, is only as, as fully alive as, 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 it, as we make it in our lives. And at, at, there are these core, as you say, acts of faith and devotion um, that, uh, that, that really indicate, and well, not only do they indicate if, our, if, if this is alive in us, but they give us the opportunity to make it alive. I think that's, that's the other aspect of it. And remember, it's not just a human gesture towards God. I mean, it, it, I mean when, when you think of it in terms of a prayer, that's why I mentioned St. Peter, who says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I mean, there's, a, there's an act of faith in that and a recognition of, of the fact that I need God's help in order to, to live that faith or to have that faith. And, and so I think in that sense, it's, it, you know, Van Hildebrand would, would probably have, have thought of it in those terms, that this is not something that can rest on us alone, uh, and that there's always a, de always a dependency on, on God to sustain us in, 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 in our Christian walk. So in any yeah. case, I think that that's one of the, the, the you know the particularly rich strands of his of his thought at the time. I mean he had I mean he spoke of many other things too. I mean the um, I mean he thought for example that uh, you know he, he for something a little bit more intellectual but aimed at 
believers at the time was this 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 great temptation of rationalizing. So mm-hmm. in the early years of the of of the Nazi party right after Hitler comes to power in the early 30s there was a there was a strong movement uh, in, among German Catholics to sort of imagine, you know, a kind of Catholicized Nazism, you know, could we give it a Christian turn? Could we, w- wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take leadership positions and in that way sort of, uh, sort of strip away the worst, maybe strip away those aspects that are, you know, a little bit rough around the edges. But von Hildebrand recognized that that was a failing project from the beginning. And this goes back to the issue of seeing first principles. He didn't need to see that that was impossible because it was impossible, or it turned out to be impossible, he he knew that was the case because there was nothing. And he he always he he often spoke about how Nazism and Christianity are uh, fundamentally irre- irreconcilable with each other. There's there there is under no circumstance a form of Nazism that could be Christianized. To us, that seems obvious, but at the time, it was a it was a great effort. There was a, there was a, a priest that he had to criticize who, at a Catholic conference, spoke of the the Third Reich as the manifestation of the body of Christ in the natural world. I mean, can you imagine, um, you know, a cultural context in which that type of thinking was encouraged? And, uh, of course, when, you know, looking back, I mean, one can appreciate what was going on. There was probably a lot of fear, a lot of looking in the wrong direction. But the fact is that but Hildebrand um, was, was somehow immune to that because he knew it wasn't possible from the beginning. No, that's great stuff. And, John Henry, I'm glad you touched on um, von Hildebrand's early resistance to the movement. Uh, you know, for for us looking backwards, I think the image that we often have in our minds is like the movie Valkyrie with Tom Cruise. Right. And we can imagine right. ourselves as Valkyrie, like, oh, when I saw these atrocities happening, I would be like the hero with the eye patch who would assassinate Hitler. I haven't actually seen the movie, so I may be getting that wrong. But um, <laughs> that was you know, risky uh, business, bud. Actually, okay, yeah, <laughs> you mixed up Tom Cruise movies. No, but uh, the, the, the renowned theologian Bishop Robert Barron, he's written an article, Why We Need Dietrich von Hildebrand. And, and I really liked him there, and maybe you can speak more to this. He says, you know, Hildebrand gives us an image of someone, or an icon of someone who resists the meh culture. You know, this, yes. this whatever attitude. He quotes Big Lebowski. There's a truly great movie. Well, that's just like your opinion, man. And I think, you know, we don't want to overstate the parallels between different historical periods. But I can see in our culture... You know, maybe not a movement to the the kind of dramatic situation that we saw in Germany, but this kind of uh, this development where people are becoming sort of nonchalant about ethical matters of of, of great import. And von Hildebrand gives us um, an icon of someone who who spoke to that as well. That's very true. Yeah. So so Father or then Father Baron in his article. Um, yeah. He's always picked up on Hildebrand as the great critic, a great critic of relativism, and and relativism is the mel- the meh culture, right? You know, it's the, you know, um, you know what works for you is good for me, something else, you know, and and then also beneath that, it, you know, a, a, an indifference that arises because you know if there's nothing, if there's no common moral or spiritual standard that unites us, I mean, then you know there is that further problem that we just sort of become disengaged and we don't care about ourselves and others. And and von Hildebrand obviously, you know, believed firmly in the objectivity, uh, meaning the the reality, reality in two ways: the reality um, outside of my own mind of what is good, good and right and true, but also the idea that this reality is something that applies to all of us commonly. You know, that it's not just a, a you know true, but true for me. It's really true for all of us. Or it's a line that Alice von Hildebrand often quotes, which I love, is she says, um, "Truth." Is, is never just mine, it is ours. You know, so rather than this idea that it applies to all of us, I think sometimes contemporary people struggle with, with the idea of the objectivity of truth because there's this sensitivity to being imposed on. But Alice brilliantly flips this and she says, well, it's not really a matter of imposition, it's a matter of the fact that it includes all of us. We all participate in this truth. And then it's liberating, it's shared. You know, it can't be um, imposed on uh, there's this sort of image that truth is this thing that you know um uh, dubious uh, institutions and individuals foist on others right the church foists its truth on 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 poor um you know sort of uh, poor people who really have their own truth so yeah, yeah so van hildebrand in many many ways i mean i think he fundamentally realized that truth is a an independent reality and that it's in fact not a straitjacket but a liberation um, from from all of the the 
from everything that would otherwise suffocate us. You know, right? If we go our own ways, are we really free, or are we just the slave of our passions? Well, I gotta so, say, I gotta say, John Henry, we do have a a, a truth that is foisting itself upon us, and that's that <laughs> we've ran out of time. And I want to I want to leave you a little bit of time uh, before uh, the old clock and Jeb, our uh, the guy on the board, strangles us. Uh, I know you have a lot of stuff coming up that uh, if people are interested in this, a lot of places they can go. Uh, not only to check this out like on your website or books, uh, but I think you also have a conference coming up. So how about you let people know that, uh, like I said, we can talk about this for a lot more. If they're interested, where can they go to find out more about the project itself and about Diedrich von Hildebrand? So they can go to the Hildebrand Project's website, which is just hildebrandproject.org, and they will find um, much additional material there, uh, including uh, books and blog posts and, and other and, and a good deal of video as well. But perhaps even more uh, interesting and effective is, is our Facebook page, which is simply Hildebrand Project at Facebook. And if people follow us on Facebook and they click on See First uh, in, their op- in their options, they'll, they'll, in that sense, be insured of receiving all of our notifications uh, about new publications and events. And in particular, we have a summer seminar coming up. It's being held with our partner, uh, Franciscan University, on the campus of the university uh, from May 29th to June 3rd. So though the conference is now closed, it's on the theme Love, Sex, and the Human Person, and it will explore the theology of the body of John Paul II and also Ben Hildebrand's writings on marriage. We will be live-streaming all of the sort of main stage sessions, and there will be 10 of those, or 11, maybe even 12, now that I think of it, and those will be streamed over Facebook. And, and again, if people are signed up not just to follow us but to see first, then they'll, they'll get every notification of a live stream, and so they'll be able to hear from renowned people like Janet Smith, and Maria Federica and other other uh, Pete Colosi, others who are are known for their expertise in the in the thought of John Paul II and Dietrich von Hildebrand. And again, that's uh, May 29th through June 3rd. And we just invite all of your listeners to follow us and and to join in. That will be, a, I think, a very rewarding experience for them. Well, wonderful, and I think that people are looking forward to, uh, like you said, going and following you and uh, keeping up with the events of the Hildebrand Project. John Henry, thank you so much. Uh, it has been a wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, good luck on your work, and God bless. We'll talk to you again sometime. All right. Thanks to both of you, Bud and Bo. Thanks, John Bye. Henry. Yep. Well, Bud, uh, we're coming to a wrap on the show. Uh, like in, in, Intense things to talk about, a lot of things that uh, to, to let, have people ponder about. I really like yeah. bringing around uh, the practicalities of thinking about how even an age like what was going on in World War II, that we can try to think about how that makes us live life different. So thank you for uh, fishing out another one of your buddies to bring on the show. Yeah, I went as... Um I went as Tom Cruise and Valkyrie for Halloween last year, but I think I'll go as Dietrich von Hildebrand this go round. That's right. I, d- so. <laughs> I, or, I don't know if you can use the eye patch again. I know that you made an investment in the eye patch. That's the new evangelization. <laughs> when people fantastic. ask, that would be an awesome segue. Like, who are you this year? Uh, I'm Dietrich von <laughs> Maybe I'll have Dominic, my two year old. Yeah. No. I, I like that idea. You know what? Speaking of this, uh, yeah. new evangelization, uh, I know that we've been really pushing it today, but it's our first time, and I'm just proud I've made a website that works. So patreon.com, patreon.com slash ICR for Iowa Catholic Radio. That's where you can go get exclusive content. Bud, we're going to, after the show closes up, record our uh, first exclusive content. I think I'm going to talk to you guys about needing to learn how to pronounce meh, right, the word yeah. M- M-E-H. You guys are doing a horrible job, so we can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> You know, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I know. I think this is riveting stuff. All you got to do to be able to hear it is donate. So if you want to, if you want to get this straightened out, there you go. Well, Bud, again, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor, and uh, may Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts and our families, our city, our state, our nation, the entire world, the galaxy. This has been the Uncommon Good. God bless everybody. <laughs> But if people want to uh, be a part of Iowa Catholic Radio and stay in tune with everything that's going on, like we've said before, Iowa Catholic Radio on Facebook, at IA Catholic Radio, the Twitter handle, um, the Zip Whip line, 515-223-1150. In tune, our bi-weekly e-newsletter. Uh, but we have all sorts of stuff going on. I just have here sitting on the desk, in fact, Bishop uh, Pates uh, will celebrate the annual Memorial Day Mass on Monday, May 28th at Glendale Cemetery, 4909 University Avenue in Des Moines at 10 a.m. Uh, we have 
like we said, very particular things like that happening coming up very soon. We have the Christ Our Life Conference. All sorts of things for people to be a part of if they go get in touch with us. Uh, what else on the station do people have the opportunity to get in touch with us, Bud? Well, I was just going to say real quick, you know, I would encourage our listeners um, with Memorial Day coming up to turn that into like um, another All Souls Day, really, an opportunity to pray for our deceased loved ones. Um, on the station itself, all sorts of great opportunities at 11, Christ is the Answer with Father John Ricardo, always delving deep into the faith there. But you can start the day with um, the Bible in a year at 5 a.m., transition straight into the rosary. The rosary is play- prayed later in the day as well at, um, at 9.30. So a lot of great opportunities to deepen your prayer life. And I know that we, we're just talking about the Patreon account. I know it can sound like when you listen to things like Catholic Radio that we're always begging for money. But you know what? St. Francis begged, so, you know... What are you going to do, folks? No, but to be honest about this, what we're going to say is, of course, our ministry is not just the people yapping on the radio like me and Bud. It's not the people behind the boards in the office. It's also you. And when you donate to Iowa Catholic Radio, you are donating to the ministry that Jesus Christ has through the radio waves on 24-7 that can penetrate through walls here in Iowa, in the central Iowa, um, but also, like I said, in new places like the 10 stations we play in Oklahoma. Um, so if you have us in mind, uh, just remember to, to donate that it's uh, not to, for some profit, but to continue the ministry of Iowa Catholic Radio. And we have many ways to do this. We do the Spring Carathon. We have people that donate monthly. And then we have things like the Patreon.com slash ICR so that we can ra- raise particular funds, for instance, with the Comrex Opal so that Bud can get out of the well. Um, but we do this all not only for you, but for the honor of our King Jesus Christ. So please, if you feel so inclined, uh, please be uh, to donate. Well, Bud, it's been a fantastic show. You take care there, and if you discover All more right. sandwiches, well, I'm always open to listening to more sandwiches. All right, I'll have sandwich updates prepared weekly. <laughs> sandwich update. <laughs> sandwich update. <laughs> uh, like I said, for Bud, this is Bo. God bless. We will see you next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one. And anytime on podcast, just search for The Uncommon Good.